Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Now, we've already covered some pretty fascinating abandoned ships in this series, but what blows my mind is that there is still always more to talk about. All across the globe, ships become stuck and are left to the elements, rotting silently for decades until they collapse into the sea. So without any further ado, here are four more amazing abandoned ships with even more amazing true stories behind them. Lying desolated on the shores of a small island in the Indian Ocean is the wreckage of the MV Primrose. This fairly unremarkable cargo ship was at the center of a terrifying encounter with an isolationist tribal group that kept its sailors trapped for three days between a storm at sea and death at the hands of the local inhabitants. Since its wrecking in 1981, the ship has been largely left to rot. The Primrose began life in 1968 as the Matsuyama Maru, However, it wasn't long until it was sold to the Panamanian registered Primrose Shipping Company and renamed, appropriately enough, the Primrose in 1972. The ship was a bulk carrier with a gross tonnage of 10,369 tons, which put it on the smaller side of that class of ship. It was mostly used for short sea journeys to ports small enough that they could not be served by larger vessels. On the night of the 2nd of August 1981, the Primrose was carrying a cargo of chicken feed from Bangladesh to Australia when it was struck by a storm passing through the region. The waves battered the cargo ship, and during the night it ran aground in a coral reef, just off the coast of North Sentinel Island. The crew of 31 men endured a night of crashing waves aboard the stricken vessel, unsure of where they had landed, or how damaged the Primrose even was. When dawn broke the next morning, it became clear that the Primrose was stuck fast in the reef with little hope of being refloated, and to make matters worse, the storm had not yet abated, and it was far too dangerous to lower lifeboats into the water. Captain Liu, the ship's skipper, made the decision to keep the crew on board for the time being and wait for the waters to calm before attempting to evacuate. And for the first morning, things on the island seemed to be calm, and from their vantage point aboard the ship, the crew believed the island to be deserted. However, it soon became clear to the sailors on board that the island was not as empty as it had first appeared, because men appeared on the beach, naked except for their belts and carrying spears, bows, and arrows. Now unfortunately, because they are so remote, there are precious few photographs of the Sentinelese people that exist. So for this video, we've had to use photographs of other uncontacted tribes from around the globe. Now it's thought that there are around about 200 uncontacted groups of people on the planet, with many of them existing in South America. But because they are so distant and so far away, it's thought that the Sentinelese people are possibly the most remote group of people on the planet. They began to wave their weapons at the ship and to build boats on the beach for a boarding action. The Sentinelese tribe on the beach clearly wasn't very happy to have visitors to their island, and with good reason. North Sentinel Island is part of the Andaman Islands. This region has been subjected to extensive slave trade in the past, and diseases brought by the British had completely wiped out many of the tribes in the region. Finally, during the Second World War, the islands had been the site of intense conflict between the British and the Japanese. All this had fostered an intense distrust of outsiders among the island's tribe. Even though the crew of the Primrose meant no harm to the island's inhabitants, any contact at all could have wiped them out simply through the spread of disease. The islanders apparently felt it was safer to simply kill the men on board. Sensing the danger, Captain Liu issued a distress call to the Regent Shipping Company, the company that had supplied the crew for the ship. It read, Wild men, estimate more than 50, carrying various homemade weapons and making two or three wooden boats. Worrying they will board us at sunset, all crew members' lives not guaranteed. And he finished this call with a request for a shipment of firearms. These were never delivered, however. Luckily, for the crew of the Primrose, the storm did not abate, which prevented the tribesmen from reaching the ship in their canoes and blew the arrows they fired well off course. For three days, the crew remained on board the ship, keeping a 24-hour watch on the islanders and arming themselves with flare guns, axes, and metal pipes that they had salvaged from the wreckage of the ship. On the mainland, a hasty rescue effort was organized and an Indian naval vessel was dispatched to aid the stranded crew until they were finally able to be evacuated from their ship on the 5th of August. No one on either side of the confrontation died, but had it not been for the stormy waters surrounding the ship, the men of the Primrose would likely have been killed. Today, the vessel is almost impossible to reach without falling afoul of the Sentinelese inhabitants, who to this day refuse any extended contact with the outside world. What we know about the state of the vessel comes mostly from satellite images, and the wreck today appears rusted and largely submerged, with only the bow of the ship remaining out of the water. Large sections of the deck have either fallen away or been salvaged by the Sentinelese. Interestingly, an anthropological expedition to the island in 1991 proved that the islanders were, for the first time, using metal tools and weapons. The wreckage of the Primrose had inadvertently provided the Sentinelese with their first access 
to usable metal. Now this next vessel famously killed more of its own crew than those that it was ever designed to face in combat. Long before the submarine became a staple of modern navies, the idea had been, pun intended, floating around the heads of inventors and militaries around the world. During the American Civil War, this concept was finally proven viable, as the CSS Hunley was the first submarine to ever sink another vessel in combat. Despite being lost with all hands in the effort, the submarine was the harbinger of a new era of naval development, and its carcass spent the ensuing century and a half lost at the bottom of the ocean until it was eventually discovered, and the wreckage now sits in a museum in Charleston, having been recovered in 2000. The Hunley was the third attempt by its designer, Horace Hunley, to build a submarine. The first two efforts, Pioneer and the American Diver, were both failures. Hunley, however, learned from his experience with the first two designs and utilised all this shipbuilding knowledge on what was to be the last and arguably the most successful of his designs, albeit one that would kill its crew no fewer than three times. The Hunley was basically a rolled iron tube with a propeller on the end. Weighing 7 tonnes and coming in at just under 12 metres in length, or 39 feet, it's nevertheless the ancestor of modern submarines. Various designs had been toyed with, including a steam-powered engine, but Hunley eventually fell back on what he felt was the most suitable and reliable source of power, a simple hand crank that ran the length of the submarine. Turning this crank was the role of all the crew members except for the commander, who was theoretically able to control depth and direction, though most of the time was capable of only going down. The submarine was therefore reliant entirely on its eight-man crew to provide propulsion, it's hard to imagine how dreadful the conditions were in the submarine with little room to move and no ventilation. It was armed with a single weapon, a spear tipped with an explosive torpedo that could be used to ram Union ships. And yes, this was exactly as dangerous as it sounds. <laughs> the submarine was privately built over the course of 1863, but under the supervision of the Confederate military, who at this point were eager to obtain any new technologies that might reverse the course of the Civil War. Once the ship had proven seaworthy, it was shipped from Mobile, Alabama, where it had been built, to Charleston, a blockaded city desperately requiring a new weapon. The submarine was immediately conscripted into the Confederate military on the 12th of August 1863, although Hunley himself remained an important part of the program, until his death in one of his own submarine's tests. Later that same month, a crew of eight volunteer sailors under the command of a Lieutenant Payne set out in the Hunley for a test dive. Unfortunately, the commander's inexperience with submarines, and really, who could blame him, I guess, would result in the deaths of all but three of the crew. It's unclear exactly what happened while performing a test dive on the 29th of August, but it had been suggested that Lieutenant Payne had accidentally pressed the dive pedal before the crew had prepared for submersion, and the Hunley disappeared below the waves while its hatch was still open. Payne and two sailors were able to escape, but five men drowned and the Hunley sank. Undeterred, the Confederates chose to raise the vessel from the bay it had sunk in and try again. Hunley himself now chose to join the crew of the submarine, perhaps because he felt he would not make such a basic error as Lieutenant Payne had done. On the 15th of October, less than two months after the Hunley had sunk the first time, it set out again on another trial, this time for a mock attack run. At first, things went well and the submarine successfully submerged beneath the water, but unfortunately it failed to re-emerge. Before it could be salvaged, all the crew on board had died, including Hunley himself. The prevailing theory is that one of the ballast tanks was left open which caused the ship to flood. And to their credit, they had at least remembered to close the hatch this time, but despite the sinking, the Confederates were nevertheless an optimistic bunch and raised the Hunley once again. They apparently also felt that it had been successfully tested, as only a few months after this it would take part in its first real and only attack on a Union vessel. By this time, the Union Admiral in command of the blockade had heard rumours of the submarine and ordered his ships to operate in shallow water and hang chains off the side to prevent its approach. General Beauregard, the Confederate commander of Charleston, was also tired of the Hunley by this point, calling it more dangerous to those who use it than the enemy. On the 17th of February 1864, the Confederate military sent the Hunley out on its last mission, an attempt to break the blockade of Charleston by sinking a Union ship and slipping away undetected. A crew of eight volunteers were on board. It slunk silently towards the Union warship USS Housatonic, being spotted only at the last moment before impact. The crew of the ship fired impotently towards the submarine, only to have their bullets bounce off the hull. The torpedo spear made impact, tearing through the Housatonic's hull and sinking it within five minutes. Five of its crew drowned, though the remainder were able to escape. The Hunley, however, never re-emerged and disappeared. It was not until 1995 that the vessel was found still sitting in Charleston Harbour. For the century beforehand, it was assumed that the submarine's crew had died from drowning or suffocation, but when the vessel was finally raised, the crew were still sitting at their posts. 
It's likely that the shockwave from the torpedo killed all eight crew instantly and the ship sank to the bottom of the harbour. In 2000, the wreckage of the Hunley was raised from the ocean and its crew were finally able to be buried. And today, the wreckage sits in a museum in Charleston and remains well preserved despite its extended stay at the bottom of Charleston Harbour. The Mediterranean sky originally began life as a luxury liner called the City of York, but today she exists only as a hulk with one side pointing perfectly towards the sky. Sailing under its original name of the City of York, it was one of four sister ships built for the Elliman Line. These four ships were highly luxurious vessels at the time, with a passenger capacity of only 107 and offering only single and twin bed rooms. They were each capable of making the journey between Britain and South Africa in just over two weeks, a highly respectable speed for the time period. All four of these ships operated the route between the UK and South Africa for 19 years, until competition from airlines and a lack of demand forced the line to sell the city of York to the Greek Karageorgis Line in 1971. It was then renamed to the Mediterranean Sky and converted into a ferry that sailed around Greece and the Mediterranean Sea. The company engaged in extensive renovation, converting it from its original luxurious condition into a ship more fitting for short distance passenger ferry work. The ship could now hold up to 1,000 passengers and 470 vehicles. For a last voyage, the Mediterranean Sky sailed from Brindisi to Petras and dropped off the last of its passengers and was decommissioned in Petras in August 1996. But this was not the end of the Mediterranean Sky's story. Financial difficulties in the Karageorgis line meant that they were unable to do anything with the ship and it remained in the port of Petras for the next three years without any maintenance or interested buyers. In February 1999, the Petras Port Authority was tired of having this rusting wreck taking up space in their port and at their own expense they towed the abandoned ship to Elysis. It remained here until 2002 when the lack of upkeep finally caught up with it and destroyed the structural integrity of the ship and she began to tilt to one side. To prevent it from being completely sunk, the Mediterranean sky was beached in shallow water nearby. And there, it continued to list and was able to rest on the seafloor. Remarkably, the Mediterranean sky remains where it was abandoned in 2002, despite plans from the Greek government to remove it and other wrecks from the area. The right side of the ship is completely submerged under the water, while the left remains sticking up out of the ocean. As the ship is only 100 metres off the shore, it is easily accessible to those who wish to visit. Ultimately, it was a sad end for what was once a proud ship. HMS Vixen was a British armoured gunboat designed as an experimental vessel and the first ship in the Royal Navy to utilise twin propellers in its design. She and two sister ships, the Viper and the Water Witch, were part of an experimental program investigating new methods of ship propulsion. The Vixen was built in Deptford at a cost of just over £54,000 and was launched in November 1865. She had an armoured hull of iron as well as a reinforced iron ram bow. She was equipped with two steam engines, each powering one of her screws. Despite this, she was only capable of 9 knots due to her weight. This made her immediately slow for a warship. She was also originally equipped with masts and sails, but these were removed in 1873. Despite being an innovative new design for the Royal Navy, the Vixen had a short and uneventful service life due to her unimpressive performance during testing. In 1868, only three years after launch, she was towed to Bermuda alongside the Viper to be used as mobile defensive batteries defending the Royal Naval Dockyard there. In 1896, it was decided that a better use for her would be to intentionally sink her in the channel near the naval base in order to block other ships and force any approaching vessels within range of the base's guns. This experimental vessel had been reduced to a glorified piece of fencing. Today, the wreck lies in about 10 metres of water off the coast of Daniel's Head at the west end of Bermuda. Her bow still pokes out of the water and has remained surprisingly intact given that it has rested there for over a century. At this point, however, she attracts more ships than she deters as she's become a very popular tourist attraction in the region. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy. And I'll see you again next time.